All right, I'm going to try and keep things on as much on time as possible. As loud as possible. That'll get them over here. Um, I am inherently loud, so. Uh, all right, um, I'm just going to get into the session so we don't uh, take too much time here. I'm Jonathan Eisen. I'm a professor here at UC Davis. And um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, this um, project that we've had on studying the microbiome of seagrass. Um, and uh, that's, that's not the best title. What the title should be is Lessons Learned When You Work on Something That You Know Nothing About. Um, and I wanted to use this at the beginning of this session because you'll hear lots of talks from people who know, who started off knowing something about their system. Um, this is an example of when you don't really know much about your system and uh, maybe it's a good model for developing collaborations with the, on new projects of some kind. So lesson number one, good colleagues are a good thing. So in September 2010, I got an email from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. I had funding from them already in various marine microbiology re related projects saying they had a call for proposals due, two page thing due in two months, um, I did grand ideas for new projects that they should consider funding. Um, and so that sounded really cool. We like to get money, right? And I have worked with the Moore Foundation and funding for many, many years, and this seemed like a great thing. So we brainstormed. Oh, yeah, just saying, um, my research covers sort of the ecology, evolution, and function of microbial communities. But secretly, I want to be a marine biologist. Um, and I have done marine biology research, and every time I get one of these notices from the Moore Foundation, I get really excited because they had this big marine microbiology initiative. Um, so we had this brainstorming, I contacted various colleagues, people outside my lab, people in my lab, we had phone calls, email chains, etc. Um, I, you know, we sort of progressed on this, but we weren't sure we were going to get anything done in two months, and I was also extremely busy teaching an intro bio class here called BIS2C with 700 students and four lectures per week. Fortunately, I went to the lectures by the other faculty when they were talking about plants, and Jim Doyle, a plant paleontologist, was lecturing. And he gave this lecture about the diversification of the flowering plants, and he was talking about monocot origins, and he showed this slide with the various orders that I'd never heard of in the plant group. And here are my notes. I actually scan all my notes when I'm you know, sitting there later on. And here's the thing that struck me as most interesting. Within one of these groups of monocots, some even went into the ocean. And I was that, of course, attracted my attention. Here I am struggling to find something to do with the Marine Microbiology Initiative, and here's a discussion of plants, flowering plants, that went into the ocean. So what he was talking about was the Elismatales, and within the Elismatales order there are seagrasses, plants generally known as seagrasses, marine monocots. They're the only flowering plants that live completely submerged in the marine environment. And this sounded, you know, initially sounded really interesting. I was doing work. Um, on a variety of other monocots, the rice microbiome in collaboration with Sundar and corn microbiome and other ones, but I'd never thought of working on marine monocots, but it seemed like the perfect possible project. So here are the Elismatales within the monocot lineage. And what was most interesting, when I went to talk to Jim Doyle afterwards, he pulled out this paper, showed me some figures from it. We remade one of the figures. But the basic idea that was most interesting was within the Elismatales, there were three main groups of seagrasses labeled clade one, clade two, and clade three. That is, they're polyphyletic. They're not a single lineage within the Elismatales. They're multiple separate lineages. And there have been, according to the phylogenetic analysis, three separate invasions of the marine environment. And um, convergent evolution of phenotype, reproductive strategies, morphology, physiology, and other features. And so we, at that sounded really interesting. People haven't worked a lot on convergence of microbiomes, so maybe we could do something on convergence of microbiomes of seagrass. So there were lots of other reasons to be interested. It seemed like a useful comparison to monocots, adaptation to the salt environment, and there was only one challenge. I, we knew nothing about seagrass. Um, it seems like a little bit of a limitation to put in a proposal on seagrass when you don't actually know anything about it. So going back to this lesson number one, good colleagues are a good thing. I did know that I had colleagues in my own department who worked on seagrass and did lots of interesting things about them. One of them in particular, Jay Stakowicz, did a lot of marine community ecology, including a lot of work on seagrass as a model system. So I wrote him a letter and said, I'm sure this is way too long a letter to write a colleague. I wrote him an email and said, oh my god, here's this chance to get funding from the Moore Foundation, but um, you know, we, we'd like to talk to you because we know nothing about seagrass and we want to work on it. 
And Jay was awesome. He said, that's you know, great. Um, come on over. Uh, started telling us, giving us background papers, all these other things about seagrass. Seagrass, not only was the convergent evolution interesting, but he said, you know, ecologically, they're really important too. And you might want to include that in a proposal. Um, uh, he said, we have seagrass growing out of Bodega Bay. We do controlled experiments on them. I did not know that really at the time. Um, and so this seemed like a really good potential model system to work on. He told us a lot more about Zostera marina, the seagrass that he worked on, which is also known as eelgrass. It's one of the most abundant seagrass throughout the northern hemisphere. It provides shelter for all sorts of marine animals. And so we put together a proposal, me and Jay and Jessica Green and Jenna Lang, who was in my lab, we called it the J4 proposal. Um, and amazingly, it got funded by the Moore Foundation. And you don't need to read the details on this. Basically, we proposed doing evolutionary studies, ecological studies, and functional studies of the microbiome of seagrass. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of those findings in terms of these lessons. Lesson number two, location matters, except when it doesn't. Um, so what do you do when you know nothing? What we did, one of the first things we did was try to mimic many of the burgeoning rice, corn, human microbiome studies by saying, OK, what does the variation look like within an individual seagrass plant in terms of their microbiome? So an undergraduate in my lab, Hannah Hall and Moritz, and another undergraduate, Ruth Lee and Jenna Lang, basically collected some seagrass with Jay's help, dissected it into lots of little pieces, did ribosomal RNA, gene sequencing, PCR, informatics, et cetera, um, and then did sort of your standard PCOA, PCA analysis to cluster samples by the similarity of their microbial communities, and found that roots, leaves, and rhizomes of the seagrass definitely form, had different uh, communities, that there were some patterns that the which roots that you looked at, um, there was some variation within roots. The closer you were to the shoot was a little different than the rest of the roots. Um, I'm not going to tell you a ton about the background here, but in addition, with sort of primitive prediction programs based upon the ribosome RNA sequence, it seemed like there might be some interesting sulfur metabolism going on in the different parts of the microbial community. Now, this made sense because of the physiology that had already been done on seagrass and because of other culture-based microbial studies that had been done on seagrass all pointed to sulfur metabolism as being uh, important. So what I want to tell you about next is the ecological studies, one of the types of studies that we did on seagrass. Um, and this relied, OK, so we wanted to do ecology of seagrass. But of course, to do that, you need to collect a lot of samples. Um, and fortunately for us, Jay Stackwitz was involved in a collaboration called Zen. The Zostera, that's the species that we were, genus of the species we were working on, Experimental Network, an NSF-funded project for collaborations across 40 sites in 24 countries who all worked on Zostera. And they were already doing multiple collaborations on genetics, on um, physiology, on population biology, on ecology, on predation. And we said, hey, maybe we can get them to do um, microbiome work. So Jenna Lang in my lab and Russell Necchies in my lab put together a, basically a proposal to them, designed a kit which we could provide to all of their field stations that could collect seagrass microbiome data from their field site. Uh, Russell actually made an ad adapter for a cheap coffee uh, filtration system that he printed with a 3D printer. Um, and we sent this all out to people and um, said, can you please sample some microbiomes for us while you're doing your field work? Um, so this is basically the workflow here. We gave them instructions for where to sample on the seagrass um, and uh, sent them these kits. And you know, the lesson, another lesson from this is good communities are a good thing, not the microbial communities, although we'll talk about that in a minute, but the actual Zen community. They all did it, or most of them did it. They sent us back these kits with um, leaves, roots, sediment, and water in the microfuge tubes with a buffer to stabilize them. We then, in my lab, did DNA extraction and sequencing and informatics on a project led by Ashkan Fahimapur from Jessica Green's lab, and also collaboration with Jessica Green and Jenna Lang and Melissa Kardash. All of the things I'm talking about, Jay Stakowitz was involved in, so I didn't include him on all the uh, slides here. Um, so when you do clustering of these samples um, based upon the community composition, you see some interesting patterns. So for example, here, um, the samples from sediment show up distinct from the samples from roots, show up distinct from the samples from leaves. The leaves do not seem to be distinct from the water. So that's a really interesting finding. The leaves are actually more similar to the microbiome of the local water that they're found in than any other water from any other place. And so we think that the leaves are basically 
passive surfaces for acquiring the microbiome, whereas the roots um, and the sediment showed much more localization-based structure in the microbiome. We went into detail on some of the uh, taxa that were found in the samples, looked for ones that were enriched in particular uh, ones of those samples. So we found, for example, sulfuromonas taxa predicted to be involved in sulfur metabolism are excessively enriched in the roots compared to the sediment, leaves, and water, um, and made a lot of other predictions about the microbial community based upon, again, the taxonomic composition of the samples found across the biogeographical range. We then um, did a few other projects involved in looking at sort of location effects. So one of them was uh, coordinated by Cassie Edinger in my lab in collaboration with Sophie Vorman, who had been working in Jay Stakowitz's lab, and Jenna Lang. They basically asked a question that's common in community ecology, but not done as much in microbiome studies, which is, if you look at a patch of seagrass, for example, you can ask, um, are the seagrass in the inside of the patch different from the seagrass in the outside of the patch um, in the edge of the patch versus different from things on the outside. So we basically collected microbiome samples from inside the edge and outside the patch and asked how similar were they to each other. And again, ribosomal RNA sequencing, um, clustering, PCOA analysis, and basically the main conclusion was that from, for the plant microbiomes, the plants in the center of the patch versus the edge, there did not appear to be a big difference between them. Um, but the edge effect was seen for the sediment. So the sediment that was collected in the middle of the patch was different from the sediment that was collected in the edge of the patch versus sediment on the outside. So again, there's some type of structure in the, the microbes in the sediment, some type of structure in the microbial communities found in those different locations. So lesson number four, disturbance can be good and bad. I, all my lessons are basically, you know, can be true in, no matter what you do. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of looking at this. Um, one of them involved a project uh, started by Jessica Abbott um, and Susan Williams and Jay Stackwitz, and then uh, Cassie Edinger in my lab got involved in looking at the microbiome component of this. Basically what they did was an experiment looking at ammonification in experimentally controlled seagrass beds. Um, and then uh, after the seagrass were sort of manipulated in a couple of ways, we then collected microbiome samples over time looking at whether or not there was any association of the microbial community with measured rates of ammonification or other things that they were measuring about the physiology in these communities. Turns out there weren't, um, but Cassie got um, some really interesting findings out of this uh, anyway by looking, instead of association with the ammonification, just looking at succession of the microbial communities during the course of this time series ammonification experiment. And what this shows is basically um, relative abundance of particular groups of organisms grouped by phyla, bacteroidetes, chloroflexi, planktomycetes, and proteobacteria um, through the time series in the experiment. And what you see in particular when she looked in more detail at this was the taxa that changed the most during the course of the experiment were proteobacteria, and the ones that changed the most were ones predicted to be involved in sulfur metabolism, with some going up during the course of the experiment, some going down in sort of counteracting ways. So um, again, we started out knowing nothing about the microbes associated with the seagrass, with the eelgrass. This is not like the most groundbreaking discovery in the history of the world, but it's starting to point us in directions of interesting functions that are worth pursuing for follow-up studies of the seagrass microbial community. So we have lots of things pointing us towards sulfur metabolism, a few things pointing us towards nitrogen metabolism, which I didn't mention from some of the other studies, but this is now guiding us in where we're going to go in the future for seagrass studies. Another type of manipulation that is of great interest these days is temperature manipulation. As the oceans warm, it's of great interest to know what happens to the organisms that live in the ocean. Jay Stackwitz's lab um, has been doing experiments in collaboration with a variety of others on temperature effects on the population diversity, physiology, um, et cetera, of seagrass, and what we basically did here was add in a microbiome component to those ongoing experiments. So again, the fact that we found this collaborator who was already doing extensive work on seagrass and experimental studies allowed us to get much more rapidly into the dynamics of microbiomes in association with interesting and important events 
in these seagrass um, than we would have been able to if we had just sort of started from scratch. So what they did in this basic this experiment was basically um, take seagrass, put them into these growth chambers, and then manipulate the temperature either up or down in these growth chambers, study the physiology of the seagrass, and at the same time we collected samples for microbiome studies. And Alana Furl, who was a postdoc in my lab, and Laura Reynolds, Katie Dubois, Jessica Abbott, and Susan Williams, in addition to Jay um, Stackwitz and others, have been looking at this uh, data. And I'm just going to show, this is unpublished, but I'm going to show one slide that Alana sent me about this. Basically, the leaf microbiomes from the seagrass show temperature-related shifts. Um, the root-associated microbiomes don't show, at least we haven't detected as much, temperature-associated shifts. It may be that the temperature um, effect is just buffered in the sediment and, and in association with the roots compared to the leaves. The leaves may be more dramatically affected by this. Um, okay, so um, I'm just sort of trying to give you a taste of what we've been trying to do, again, when we started with basically nothing about the microbial communities associated with seagrass, I'm not telling you all of the different studies that people have been doing associated with this project, but basically we've had um, graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates doing a variety of work on different aspects of seagrass and their microbiomes, um, and just trying to get a handle on what the diversity is like, again, in order to sort of guide uh, future studies. So lesson number five is don't forget your roots. Um, I left out a part of this story when I was talking about, um, uh, when I was telling you I was interested in marine biology. That originally came from when I was an undergraduate uh, getting involved in marine biology research, and I had sort of ditched this for a while. But um, don't forget your roots. Um, so uh, what I want to tell you about a little bit is this intraplant sampling, but going into more detail on it, I showed you a slide before about um, sampling the different parts of an individual plant. Um, and Lar Van, who was a graduate student in my lab, um, decided to take some of the samples that we had ribosomal RNA data for. We still had DNA in the freezer for those samples. We had analysis of them that suggested they were interesting in a variety of ways. And we sent off uh, some of the samples for metagenomic shotgun metagenomic sequencing to try and look at uh, the communities from a different way to look at the metagenomic data. And I'm not going to tell you all about this. The, you know, uh, Andreas and uh, already mentioned um, you know, some of the benefits that come from metagenomics. There are many reasons why you might want to go if you're trying to characterize a community to go beyond ribosomal RNA sequencing and move into complete shotgun metagenomic sequencing of the community. It gives you finer scale taxonomic resolution. It allows you to do functional predictions based upon analysis of presence and absence of genes. It allows you to possibly assemble genomes. It allows you to do population genomics. You can do all sorts of things with the metagenomic data. Um, and Laura is starting to do that um, with analyzing uh, the metagenomic data here. She's working on a paper on uh, the intraplant biogeography associated with these metagenomic samples. Um, but what I want to show you is just this one little thing, um, story that we found by looking at the metagenomic data. So we got back millions and millions of sequence reads from, uh, I think, 12 samples or so. I don't know exactly how many samples um, we looked at. And I decided, you know, I don't really do anything in the lab, but I decided to actually look at the data here um, and um, uploaded the data to a web server that does taxonomic classification based upon composition of the sequences called Kaiju. And uh, then it produces these chronoplots, which you can view these circular taxonomic diagrams of the taxonomic classification assigned to particular reads. And here's the classification for a particular sample. Uh, I zoomed in on the bacteria portion of the classification, and you can see dominated by proteobacteria. Uh, these are basically the firmicutes, the FCB group, and then small number of sequences from a lot of other groups. And I was just sort of browsing around, zoomed in on the proteobacteria branch and saw this really interesting thing, which is that many of the sequences mapped to proteobacteria were annotated as coming from chemosynthetic symbionts. The endosymbiont of Loripes lucinalis, um, unculture, unclassified gamma proteobacteria that was also turns out to be an endosymbiont, endosymbiont of Kodakia orbicularis. These are all intracellular bacteria that live inside the gill tissue of clams. Now, we didn't think we had any clams in our sample, um, but we could have had larval, uh, larval forms of the clams. But this was really interesting to me, in particular, 
because it's well known that clams are found in seagrass beds. Um, there's been a lot of work on clam diversity associated with seagrass. There have even been some suggestions, which are pretty controversial, that clams might be involved in some of the sulfur protection that occurs in seagrass sediment and seagrass roots via their chemosynthetic endosymbionts that live inside of them. The reason I'm telling you this is, um, as an undergraduate, I was looking for something to do, and I basically got pointed to a new professor at Harvard where I was an undergraduate who worked on chemosynthetic endosymbionts that live inside marine invertebrates, including the giant tube worms from the bottom of the ocean. And I got this project assigned to me by Colleen to work on this clam that comes from eelgrass beds in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where we had to go out and collect clam samples. And then I spent a year and a half sequencing a single ribosomal RNA gene um, from the endosymbiont that lives inside this clam, Solomaya velum. Back then, you actually got a paper out of a single ribosomal RNA gene. Um, so I got a paper. Here's the phylogenetic tree that I did in the paper. And I be fell in love with marine biology because of this work with Colleen and on these chemosynthetic um, clams. So um, associated with many marine sediments, you find a diversity of clams in those marine sediments. Some of those clams have reduced or completely disappeared digestive systems. No mouth, no gut, and they just have bacteria that live inside of them, like in their gills, that make sugars for them in the same way that chloroplasts make sugars for plants. And that's what I had been working on as an undergraduate. And so I was you know, completely, I, I think I texted Laura like five minutes later, I was just going crazy, finding these endosymbionts in this um, you know, seagrass dissection, the sample. And the reason I was interested in this was, even though I wasn't working on this anymore, over the years, I had continued to sort of do a little bits of projects with my old undergraduate advisor. I was involved in the first sequencing of the genome of one of these chemosynthetic endosymbionts from a clam, from the giant clam Calyptogena magnifica. We also sequenced the genome of the Solomaya velum symbiont that I had worked on as an undergraduate. And I'd followed the literature that said, we have no idea what's going on in terms of transmission of these symbionts from parent to offspring. Many of them can't be found in the eggs. Some can't be found in the larvae, but they show up in the adults. And we have no idea where they're found. They had done PCR surveys of the environment, gone looking for them, hunting, not been able to find any close relatives of the chemosynthetic endosymbionts anywhere in the sediments associated where these clams are found or in the water. Well, we have them. So 16S um, ribosome RNA sequences, genome, fragments that we've been able to assemble from the community all look like this. Here's a 16S hit from the roots and also from the leaves associated with seagrass. Um, it shows up in a clade where every single other thing in the clade is a known to be, that is known where it came from, is a chemosynthetic endosymbiont of a clam. So what's going on here? No idea. But one possibility is that this is a free-living version of the endosymbionts in much the same way that many other endosymbionts like rhizobia have a lifetime where they live out in the wild and then become endosymbionts. Uh, this happens with the squid endosymbionts, the luminescent squid endosymbionts, Vibrio fisheri, live out in the water and then colonize the squid. Maybe this is where the endosymbionts spend their time when they're not inside the clams. So, you know, we haven't proven anything here, but I'm very excited to connect back to my undergraduate research uh, with this seagrass microbiome project. So I just want to end uh, really quickly talking about some of the future plans, just giving you a couple of examples here. One is pretty amazing. We put in a proposal with Janine Olson and Eve Vandepeer and Jay Stackwitz and I to the Joint Genome Institute to do um, population genomics of Zostera marina and microbiome studies side by side with the same individual plants so that we can do GWAS, genome-wide association studies, where the microbiome is the trait that we're looking at, the association with the genomes. And amazingly, we got this funded. I'm still stunned by this. The reason we got it funded was JGI in 2016 published the first complete genome sequence of any seagrass, Zoster marina, where Janine Olson was the PI on this project. So they're going to resequence 216 individual seagrass plants, and we're going to get microbiome data from all of those individual plants. We're also getting partial genome sequences from multiple other seagrass, as well as microbiome data from across that clade. So we're moving into seagrass population. Uh, genome microbiomics, or something, if you want to invent a new omics word. 
And this is only possible, again, because of the Zen project. There, um, Laura and other people in my lab sent out kits to many places who collected samples that are part of this uh, project. And I just want to hint at one last thing, which again comes up from Have Good Colleagues. I have uh, Raquel Pexota is doing a sabbatical in my lab from Brazil, and she works on coral and mangrove microbiomes. Uh, my time is up, so I'm going to try and end really quickly. What she has shown in a series of experiments is that you can increase the ability for mangroves and coral to survive stresses by adding in beneficial microbes back into the mix before or even after they get stressed. So this is an experiment in mangroves showing before and after adding back microbiomes to that situation and the mangroves do much better after you add back in these potentially beneficial microbes. They're also doing the same thing with coral. In order to do this well, we need a culture collection in order to add back in individual microbes and fortunately We've been working on that in my lab. David Coyle has been doing what we call massively parallel undergraduate experiments, where undergraduates are culturing a diversity of microbes associated with seagrass. Um, and I will just end it there with the last lesson, which is good people are a good thing. Um, thanks. And I tried not to go over, but we don't have any time for questions, so I think we're going to move on to the next talk. And are you going to do it on your computer, or I'm going to leave you this, or you have an adapter, or, or you can, all right. <laughs>